Chapter 8, Invalidation of Destiny. Vashishtu, Vashishta continued saying that, what does destiny mean? It has no form, no act, no motion or might. It's only a false notion rooted in the minds of the ignorant. Destiny is a word that has come into fashion from the idea of karma, the idea of future retribution for one's past actions and the like. From this, ignorant are led to believe that there is such a thing as destiny, something incapable of explanation, which has led them to a fallacy, much like mistaking a rope for a snake. Yesterday's misdeed is rectified by the following day's good action. Therefore, let this day supersede the past and employ yourself today to action. The perverted understanding that believes in destiny is grounded on false conception. One man may well enter fire with the conviction that it will not burn unless it is so destined. If destiny is the sole cause of everything, then why should a man take actions of bathing and making his offerings, sitting and walking, all of which may be done by his destiny? What then is the need to advise another to do something if destiny is the director of all? Let them all be silent and say nothing to nobody. There is none to be seen on earth who is motionless except the bodies of the dead. If it is action that produces anything, then it is useless to believe in destiny. Nor is there any cooperative power of invisible destiny that is perceptible in the actions of men. Destiny is only a meaningless word. Instruments and hands are two things joined together. Each has its separate action. But if the hand is lacking, nothing can be done by destiny. Whether in the mind and intellect of a learned pundit or illiterate coward, there is no such idea of destiny. Hence, it is a mere non-entity. If destiny does not mean agent, it must mean something else. If it is the same thing as agent, why give it a different name, destiny? If it can be proved to be an imaginary term, why not imagine your efforts to be the agent? Immaterial destiny, like a void, has no connection with the material body. If it had form or figure, it would be invisible. Therefore, destiny is non-existent. If destiny were the mainspring of the moments of all beings in the three worlds, then let all creatures rest at ease with assurance that destiny will perform their parts. The belief that we are guided by destiny and do as we are led to do is a deception and an excuse. In fact, there is no such thing as destiny. It is a fool who fancies a destiny to himself and relies upon it 
to his own disadvantage. The intelligent raise themselves to better states by means of their effort. Say, who is there in this world among the mighty and brave or the intelligent and learned who looks or waits upon destiny? Destiny may be said good if it had the power of saving a man from being beheaded, whom fortune tellers had pronounced by their calculation to be long lived. Again, O Raghava, if a fortune teller predicts that a man will become learned, and he does, without being taught, then we can believe fortune is true. Mark, O Ram, how the sage Vishwamitra has cast away his destiny and attained the state of Brahma Rishi by his own efforts. Look at us and others who have become sages. It was by our industry that we became wanderers in the ethereal regions. Remember, O Ram, how the chiefs of the Dhanava race discarded their destinies altogether and used their prowess to establish their empires on earth. Look again how the chiefs of the gods have wrested the extensive earth from those demons by their valorous deeds of slaying and harassing them in battle. See, Ram, how people use their own industry to make wicker vessels so handsome that they hold water, all without the aid of any destiny. In all our works of giving and receiving, walking and resting, and the like, we see no causation by destiny in their completion, just as we see medicines causing healing. Therefore, O Ram, give up this destiny of your mistaken fantasy, which in reality is devoid of its cause or effect, and is a false and ideal nothing. Give yourself to your best efforts. So this destiny that is talked about here and all over the world, destiny, is an illusion and the reason ultimately it's an illusion is because it's based on individual karmic traces which are themselves illusions illusions in a universe of illusions the destiny that's mentioned here could be compared to the jyotish chart Earlier it mentioned about the fortune tellers saying, oh, it says here, you have a long life. So when the person escaped being beheaded, he chalked it up to his destiny. Well, actually the karma that we see in the Jyotish chart is like a little bit of wind that is pushing the leaf of life in one direction or the other. Now the leaf is like a dead thing. It has no action of its own. It just floats here and there by the wind. So if we don't take action, we're like that leaf is floating about, propelled by our own karma, our own destiny. But if we take action, which gives us this opportunity to use our intellect and say, if the wind is blowing us north, but our intellect says the destination is south, then we turn and we 
walk into the wind of karma. We face it. We move through it. And in fact, we want to achieve moksha. Literally, we must work against our karma almost all the time. Occasionally, someone is born with some wind that pushes them in the direction of moksha. But it's not going to allow them to accomplish moksha unless they take action. It's just going to be a little bit easier for that person than it is for one who does not have that pressure of karma from the past. Action is always necessary. Chapter nine, investigation of acts, thoughts or action. Mind is soul. Brahma asked, will you say, it, who is based in all knowledge, kindly explain the true sense of destiny, daiva, in popular use? Vashishta replied, it is a man's activity and nothing else, O Raghava, that is the cause of all his actions and the recipient of their consequences. Destiny has nothing to do with it. Destiny is a mere imaginary thing that neither exists nor acts nor feels their effects. It is neither seen nor regarded. Destiny refers to the good or bad results that proceed from action. People label the wished for and unwished for consequences resulting from the good and bad deeds of human activity as destiny. The majority of mankind calls human activity, which is the only cause of some unavoidable future consequence, to be destiny. O oh, Raghava, destiny, though empty as a void, appears to be real to somebody who thinks it to be an active agent, while others know it to be inactive. Again, destiny is a mere saying uttered by men upon the result of some good or bad effect in their actual efforts. That it is this which has produced the other. It is my belief, and I know it for certain, that destiny is no more than a word uttered by people upon the attainment of their object of their exertions. Destiny is a word of consolation uttered by men to signify the good or evil they encounter and which they call to be the effect of the other. Rama asks, Sage, how is it that you, who is all wise, now contradict your own assertion that destiny is the result of the stock of our former acts? Vashishta answered saying, well said, O Ram, you know everything, but hear me tell you the whole of it, whereby you will have a firm belief in the non-existence of destiny. In the end, even all the various kinds, the various desires that men have entertained in their minds come to be accounted as his deeds. All animals also act according to their desires, doing nothing for which they have no inclination in their natures. As a villager goes to his village and a townsman goes to town, so it is the nature of desire to lead men to their particular acts. The keen and firm resolution with which an act was done in a former state of life, that truly is termed destiny and successive births. Thus the acts of all active beings conform to their nature and the actions of men 
in accordance with their desires. Desire is nothing other than the mind itself, and the mind is the same as the human soul. The mind is the soul and cause of all acts which they call the doings of destiny. Certainly without the mind, there is no destiny. This mind is truly the living soul that acts as it desires and accordingly enjoys the fruit. The same is destiny. Ram, know that the mind, the heart, desire, action, and destiny are synonymous terms applied by the virtuous to the unascertainable soul. Now, whatever the so-named soul undertakes to do, continually and with a firm resolution, it obtains the fruit thereof accordingly. O oh, support of Raghu's race, it is by means of the activity or effort of the soul and by no other means that the soul obtains everything. May it lead you to your good only. Ram said, being caught in the net of my pre-existent desire, I remain a captive to them and do as they lead me to. Say then, O sage, what else I can do? Vashishtha replied, so then, Ram, you reach your lasting good if you exert your efforts for it. There is no other way. Desires of two kinds. Some lead to good and others to evil. <clears throat> Hence, the desires of one's prior state must have been of one kind or another. If pure desires guide you now, gradually, you will be led by means of your good acts to attain the state of your lasting welfare. But if wrong inclinations tend to lead you to difficulties, of necessity you must try your best to overcome such propensity. Ram, you are wise, perfectly intelligent, and composed of more than just a dull body. Now, if you need another's guidance to waken your intellect, then when is your own intelligence? If you would have someone else enlighten your understanding, then who was the other who illuminated him? And who is the other to eliminate that person also. Therefore, because no one is wholly devoid of understanding, let him improve it himself. The currents of our desires flow between two channels of good and evil. It requires the exertion of our actions to turn them to the right course. You who is the mightiest of the mighty, must exert the force of your activity to turn your mind away from a direction to the profitless and toward a profitable course. By directing the mind from the wrong to the right way, it will take the right course and the opposite is true also. But because the human mind is like a child, it must not be forced. The training of a child is like that of the mind. It is done slowly by gentleness and indulgence, and not by force or hurry. If you have already mastered all your good and bad desires by your constant practice, from now on, you have to direct your tendencies to good only. O oh, victorious Ram, when your pristine habits, you have an aptitude to do good, know that it is the result of your good nature. O oh, sinless Ram, at present, 
your desires are lying dormant in your mind. They require some practice to be employed only for the doing of good. If you will not exert yourself now to improve your dormant desires by constant practice, you can never expect to be happy. When doubtful, incline towards that is good. And as you thrive on this, you shall have no evil to fear. Whatever one practices with time, it will become perfect. Just like studying from childhood makes the learned free from error. When you have good will inside, you must accomplish your purpose by means of your activity and by your subjection to the organs of your body. So long as your mind is imperfect and unacquainted with the state of divine truth, you must attend to your teachers, books, and reasoning, and act according to their directions. Having first finished your acts and known the truth, you must abandon even your meritorious deeds and all your desires with them. Having known by your good understanding that the virtuous course led by honorable men is truly good. Give particular attention to know the nature of God, then forsake even that and remain as silent as an ancient sage. Mooney. Okay, so this is a lot of information that we should definitely understand very clearly. We're being told how to refine our actions to help us move in the direction of moksha by using our intellect. So this is a practice that is good once as a person has realized that he's being motivated by his desire. And many people don't realize that. So to them, this is not relevant. But once you realize you're motivated by desires and you know the goal of human existence is a moksha, then for sure, you must use your intellect to act on the motivations that will arise in further progress to moksha and decline to act on those desires and motivations that will take you away from moksha. And so by using the intellect in this way, we begin to move in the proper direction. And then the last verse. your particular attention to know the nature of God, then forsake even that and remain as silent. This is exactly the instruction at the start of every meditation. Find the silence that's deep within the mind. That the nature of God. Then, what do we do? We become the silent. And in this verse, forsake even that nature of God and remain as silent, as the ancient sage. So this is literally the instruction for connecting with and becoming the silent witness. Now this is not telling us to stop performing action. It's telling us to become the silent witness and observe 
as the silent witness, how the body is performing actions. And we have to observe, as we are observing the body performing actions, as the silent witness, that sometimes the body may want to perform an action that is not motivated to be supporting the entire universe. And from the silent witness, we know that action to be from individual karmic traces that still exist as a residual. So when we find the body about to do something motivated by some rock that has fallen from the ceiling of our tunnel in the mountain ranges of karma that have given us this access to the nature of God, allowed us to become the silent witness, then we don't stumble over that rock, do we? We, from our level of silent witness, we make a decision to not take that karma, karmic trace inspired action. So now we have something interesting to think about. Here is the silent witness. And it has a sense of vision, doesn't it? In the Yoga Sutras, <clears throat> that sense of vision is called Pratibha Darshasa. It is a sense, one sense, that is beyond the bodies, beyond the relative universe, Pratibha. And then as we become more and more the silent witness, we begin to understand our nature as the silent witness. And we discover that we have other senses as well in the silent witness. These we might call the absolute senses. And we have a discriminating faculty, don't we? We've achieved moksha level one. And we know by our discriminating faculty in the silent witness that we're just beginning the act of achieving the final stage of liberation, Moksha level five, unity with Krishna. So we have this interesting feature within the silent witness. When we first connect with the silent witness, it's only silent. And we don't really even use the visual sense of the silent witness, do we? But right away, we're instructed to watch the conscious thinking mind. So right away, we're told, yes, you are the silence. You, but you are the silent witness. You have some ability to act within the silence, don't you? You can direct your attention 
to watching the mantra. This is important because it tells you that the silent witness you are, you have become with its senses is not the real silent witness, is it? Hmm. We thought we had arrived. No, we haven't. When the silent witness is still witnessing, it is an illusory silent witness. Now, it's a wonderful illusory silent witness. It's the best illusory silent witness. But still, it has that quality of being illusory because it has the ability to act. So we learn this silent witness that we have become familiar with in Moksha level one and level two and level three and level four And even in level five, when we become Krishna, we still find there is a silent witness. Krishna, right now, is still observing all that he has created from the silent witness. So there's something even beyond Krishna, observing, watching. And that is Shiva. So ultimately, as we follow the silent witness to its source, it goes even beyond moksha level five. So it's a great adventure, but it'll be worth doing. Chapter 10, Brahma propounds the knowledge of liberation to Vashishta. Vashishta resumed. This thing called destiny is as true as the reality of God. It is the cause of causes and effect of effects. Now attend to my words. Depend on your efforts and intently apply your ever confident mind to the attainment of your chief good. Use your effort to control your misleading senses from pursuing their object. I will now set out a system for you that contains the essence of the best means for liberation and which will confer the fruits of your exertion and lead you to wealth, your welfare in both world. Let those who have great minds forsake their worldly desires in order to avoid future births and attend to these lectures with calm contentment. <clears throat> Weigh well the meanings of previous discussions and those to come. Repress your mind from its worldly cares and compose yourself in calmness in order to inquire after truth. Hear me relate to you, Rama, the way to emancipation, which will remove your feelings of pain and pleasure, and which will become the surest means to lead you to supreme happiness. 
on hearing this lecture on liberation in the company of all those reasonable men, you will know that highest state which is free from pain and from which there is no end. This was spoken of old in a former Kalpa age by Brahma, abiding in the Supreme Spirit. It is the remover of all anxiety and giver of all comfort to the soul. Rama asked, say, O Brahma, who is my guide? What caused move Brahma himself to reveal this knowledge of old, and how did he, how did you obtain it? The Shishta replied, the supreme soul of infinite manifestations exists by itself. It passes through and supports the whole in the form of void and understanding and is light to all living beings. From him who remains the same, unaltered being, in his rest and motion, the great Vishnu was born. Like a moving wave on the quiet waters of the sea, then Brahma was produced from the lotus of his heart, having Mount Meru for its seed, the points of the compass for its petals, and the stars for its pistol. He being beset by gods and sages, acquainted with the Vedas and their meanings, created all the worlds and all minds with their various thoughts. Then he created groups of men in the Bharata division, India, and in a quarter of Jambudvipa, Asia, and subjected them to all manner of diseases and afflictions. They were also troubled by the possession and desire of many things and their subjection to dangers and diseases. Here, all species of created beings are subject to a variety of tribulations and afflictions. The Lord and creator of worlds, seeing the misery of these people, felt compassion for them like a father for his children. Then for a moment he pondered within himself with intensity of thought and for the good of all creatures how to end the misery of these beings who were subjected to death and despair. With this thought, the Lord God Brahma established the rules of austerity, piety, charity, veracity, and pilgrimage. Having established these, the Lord and Creator again thought within himself, how to make an end of the many miseries of men he had created. He thought upon self-extinction as the supreme bliss, obtainable only through knowledge of God, and whereby my man might be exempted from repeated births and death. So there we have an important clue, don't we? self-extinction as the supreme bliss. We've talked about this before. We have to come to the state where we realize we no longer exist. That realization that all is illusion and I in illusion, I do not exist. That is becoming the silent witness in its most pure and perfect form. That is moksha. Verse 22, it was divine knowledge, he thought, that was the only means by which men could crossing the ocean of this world. 
austerity, charity, and pilgrimage were no means to it. Divine knowledge. Okay, so now we're getting to Yoga Vishishta, aren't we? We're realizing that only austerity, charity, and pilgrimage is not going to take us to final liberation. That's because we have knowledge constructs that are composed of individual karmic traces. And therefore we must have divine knowledge constructs to counteract them, to purify them, to balance them. And so it is divine knowledge that is the ultimate, the only means. With this he said, I will immediately make a new and sure bridge for the salvation of men and their liberation from pain. Having thought so, Lord Brahma, on the, sitting on the lotus, meditated in his mind and produced me from himself. Being thus produced, I immediately stood in the presence of my ancestor, like a wave rising from the sea leans towards it, holding a pitcher in one hand and a pair of beads made of seeds in the other. I bowed to the God who held a water pot in one hand and Fair beads in the other. He addressed me like this. Come, my son, he said, holding me in his hand. He made me sit on the northern petal of his lotus of truth that shone as brightly as the moon amid silvery clouds, wearing the skin of an antelope with the voice of a gander, addressing a stork. My father, Brahma, spoke to me, who was similarly dressed. He said, for a moment, I will overpower your fickle-mindedness under a mist of unconsciousness, like a dark cloud obscures the moon. It was under this curse that I lost my reason and forgot everything. Even the clear idea I had of God I became as helpless as one out of his wits and came to be afflicted with distress and sorrow like an indigent person. Oh, how sorrowful is this world, said I. How did evil come to dwell in it? With these thoughts, I remained in silence. Then my father spoke to me saying, ah, my son, why are you so afflicted? Ask me for a remedy for your affliction and you shall become happy. Then, seated as, as I was on the golden colored leaflet of the lotus, I asked the Lord Creator of all peoples about the medicine for worldly sorrows. How, my Lord, I asked, did this world come to be so full of misery and how can people be rid of it? This is what I ask of you. Then I learned the most holy wisdom that my father Brahma gave me. Following his advice, I became quite composed. Then seeing me, knowing the knowable and restored to my own natural state, the creator of the world and revealer of all causes said, my son, I had turned you to insanity by an illusion in order to make you inquire into the essence of true knowledge for the welfare of mankind. Now you are released from the curse of illusion and you have arrived to your highest state of understanding. You have become as one soul with the Supreme and as pure as gold. 
Now shut your heart against the world and proceed to the surface of the earth, to the land of Bharat, for the good of mankind. There employ yourself to ceremonial duties to the best of your knowledge and advise others on how to pro properly conduct rituals. But those who are disgusted with the world in their hearts and are rational in their elevated understanding are to be counseled with the esoteric knowledge that confers true joy. Thus being appointed by him who was born in the lotus, I continue to abide here throughout the succession of beings. I have no duty to perform here, but live my life free from all cares. I always do my acts with a mind as tranquil as if it were in a state of sleep. I do my works with the body, but I do nothing here with my soul, which is fixed in God.